it's not in here. So thank, thank you very much for having me. Um, look forward to talking about the SpaceX um, Mars architecture. And what, what I really want to try to uh, achieve here is to make Mars seem possible, uh, make it seem as though it's something that we can do in our lifetimes, um, and that you can go. And, and is there really a way that, that anyone could go if they wanted to? I think that's, that's really the important thing. So. I mean, first of all, why go anywhere, right? Um, the, I, I think th there, there are really two fundamental paths. History is going to bifurcate along two directions. One, one, one path is we stay on Earth forever, um, and then there will be some eventual extinction event. Um, I, I don't have an immediate doomsday prophecy, but there's, it's eventually history suggests there will be some, some doomsday event. Uh, the alternative is to become a space-faring civilization and a multi-planet species, which uh, I hope you would agree that is the right way to go. Yes? <laughs> That's what we want. Yeah. So how do we figure out how to how to take you to Mars um, and, and create a, a self-sustaining city, a, a city that um, is not merely an outpost but can become a planet in its own right um, and for us, thus we could become a truly multi-planet species. Uh, th th there are, you know, sometimes people wonder, well, what about other places in the solar system? Why, why Mars? Um, well, um, just to sort of put things into perspective, this is this is what this is an actual scale of what the solar system looks like. So we're we're currently in the, the third little rock from the left. Uh, that's Earth. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. The and and our goal is to go to the fourth rock on the left. Uh, that's Mars. Um, but you can get a sense for the real scale of the solar system: how big the Sun is, and Jupiter, um, Neptune. Saturn, Uranus, and then the little guys on, on the right are Pluto and friends. This, this sort of uh, helps see it not, not quite to scale, but it gives you a better sense for, for where things are. Uh, so our options for, for, going to, for, for becoming a multi-planet species within our solar system are, uh, are limited. Uh, we have, in terms of nearby options, we've got Venus, uh, but Venus is a high pressure, a su super high pressure, hot acid bath. Um, so that, that would be a tricky one. Uh, Venus is not at all like um, the, the, the goddess. This is not in no way similar to, to, to the actual goddess. Um, so uh, it really difficult to make things work on Venus. Uh, Mercury is also way too close to the sun. Um, we could go potentially on, the Mar one, of the, on the, one of the moons of Jupiter or Saturn, but those are quite far out, much further from the sun, a lot harder to get to. It really leaves us with one option if we want to become a multi-planet civilization, and that's, that's Mars. Uh, we could conceivably go to our moon, um, and I certainly have nothing against going to the moon, but I think it's, it's challenging to create a, uh, a become multi-planetary on the moon because it's, it's much smaller than, than, than a planet. Uh, it doesn't have any atmosphere. It, it's not as resource rich as Mars. Um, it's got a 28 day day, whereas the Mars day is 24 and a half hours. Um, and it, in general, Mars is, is far better suited to ultimately scale up to be a self sustaining civilization. So, just to give some uh, comparison between the, uh, the, the, the two planets, um, that they're actually fairly, they're remarkably close in a lot of ways. In, in fact, um, we now believe that, that early Mars was a lot like Earth. And in fact, if we could warm Mars up, we would once again have a thick, a thick atmosphere and liquid oceans. So, but where, where things are right now, Mars is, Mars is about half again as far from the sun as, as Earth. Uh, so still decent sunlight. Um, it, it's a little cold, uh, but we can warm it up. Um, it has a, a very helpful atmosphere, which 
In the case of Mars being uh, primarily CO2, with some nitrogen and argon and a few other trace elements, means that we can grow plants on Mars just by compressing the atmosphere. Um, and, uh, so and it has nitrogen too, which is also very important for, for growing plants. Um, it would be quite fun to be on Mars because you'd have gravity, which is about 37% uh, 37, 37% that of Earth. Uh, so you'd be able to lift heavy things and bound around and like, have a lot of fun. Um, and the, the day is remarkably close to that of, of Earth. And um, so we just need to change that bottom row. Because currently we have 7 billion people on Earth and zero on Mars. So there's, there's been a lot of great work um, by NASA and, uh, and, and other organizations in early exploration of Mars and understanding uh, the, what, what Mars is like, where could we land, what's the composition of, of, the, of the atmosphere, where, where is there water, um, or ice, I should say. And, and so uh, but we need to go from these early exploration missions to actually building a city. The, the issue that we have today is that if you look at a Venn diagram, uh, we, the, there's, there's, there's no intersection of sets of people who want to go and, and can afford to go. Um, it, in fact, right now, you cannot go to Mars for infinite money. Uh, using traditional methods, uh, you know, if, if taking sort of Apollo-style approach, um, the, an optimistic cost number would be about $10 billion a person. So, for, for example, the Apollo program, it, uh, the cost estimates are somewhere between uh, 100 to $200 billion in current, current year dollars. Um, and we sent 12 people to the surface of the moon, which was an incredible thing and I think probably the, one of the greatest uh, achievements of, of humanity. Um, but but that's, that is a, a steep price to pay for a ticket. Um, that's why these circles only just barely touch. Um, so you, you can't create a self-sustaining civilization if the ticket price is $10 billion a person. What we need is a closer, is to move those circles together. And if we can get a co the cost of moving to Mars to be roughly equivalent to a median house price um, in, in the US, uh, which is around $200,000, then I think the probability of establishing a self-sustaining civilization is very high. I think it, I think it would almost certainly occur not, not everyone would want to go. In fact, I think a relatively small number of people from Earth would want to go, uh, but enough would want to go and who could afford the trip that it would happen. And you, people can get sponsorship, um, and, and I think it gets to the point where, where almost anyone, if they saved up and, and this was their goal, um, they, they could ultimately save up enough money to, to buy a ticket and move to Mars. Um, and Mars would have a labor shortage for a long time, so a jobs would not be in short supply. So but it is a bit tricky um, because we have to figure out how to improve the cost of trips to Mars by 5 million percent. Um, so this is, this is not easy. Um, and, I mean, it's, and it sounds like virtually impossible, but I, I, think, I think there are ways to do it. This, it's, this translates to an improvement of approximately four and a half orders of magnitude. These are the key elements that are needed in order to uh, achieve the four and a half order of magnitude improvements. Most of the, the improvement would come from full reusability, somewhere between two and two and a half orders of magnitude. And then the other two orders of magnitude would come from refilling in orbit, uh, propellant production on Mars, and choosing the right propellant. So I'm going to go into detail on all those. Full reusability is, is, is really the, the, the super hard one. Um, it, it's, it's very difficult to achieve uh, reusability for, for even an orbital system, um, and that challenge becomes even you know, substantially greater for a system that has to go to another planet. Um, but as an example of the difference between reusability and expendability in aircraft, and this you could actually use any form of transport. You could say a car, bicycle, horse. Um, if they were single use, almost no one would use them. It would be too expensive. Um, but with, with, with frequent flights, you can take something like that, uh, an aircraft that costs $90 million, um, and uh, if it was single use, you'd have to pay half a million dollars per flight. 
um, but you can actually buy a ticket on Southwest right now um, from LA to Vegas for forty-three dollars, including taxes. So that's, I mean, that's a massive improvement right there. It's, it's, it's showing a four-order magnitude improvement. Now this is harder. The reusability doesn't apply quite as much to Mars because the number of times they can reuse the, the spaceship is it, it, the spaceship part of the system it is left less often because the Earth-Mars rendezvous only occurs every every 26 months. So you get to use the spaceship part roughly every two years. Now you get to use the, the booster um, and the tanker as frequently as you'd like. Um, uh, and so you, it, it makes, that, that's why it really makes a lot of sense to, to load the spaceship into orbit with essentially tanks dry and have it have really quite big tanks that you then uh, use the booster and tanker to refill while it's in orbit and maximize the, the payload of, of, the, of the spaceships so that when it goes to Mars, it, you, you really have a very large uh, payload capability. So, as I said, refilling in orbit is, is one of the essential elements of this. Um, with, without refilling in orbit, you, um, you would have a half order of magnitude uh, impact roughly on, on the cost. Um, by half order of magnitude, I think the audience mostly knows, but what that means is each, each order of magnitude is a factor of 10. So um, not, ref not refilling in orbit uh, would mean a 500% roughly increase in the cost per ticket. Um, it, it also allows us to, to build a smaller vehicle and uh, lower the development cost, although this vehicle is quite big, but it would be much harder to build something that's five to 10 times the size. Um, and um, it, it also reduces the sensitivity of performance characteristics of the, of the booster rocket and, and tanker. So if there's a shortfall in uh, the performance of, of any of the elements, you can actually make up for it by having uh, one or two extra uh, refilling trips uh, to the spaceship. So this is it's very important for reducing the susceptibility of the system to a performance shortfall. And then producing propellants on, on Mars is uh, actually you know, also very obviously important. Again, if, if we didn't do this, it would have at least a half order of magnitude increase in the, in the cost of a trip, so 500% increase in the cost of the trip. Um, and it would be pretty absurd to try to build a city on, on Mars um, if, you, if your spaceships just kept um, staying on Mars and not going back to Earth. You have this like, massive graveyard, graveyard of ships. You have to like, do something with them. Um, so it really wouldn't make sense to, to, um, uh, to leave your spaceships on Mars. You really want to build a propellant plant on Mars and send the ships back. So, and Mars happens to work out well for that because it has a CO2 atmosphere, it's got water ice um, in the soil, and with H2O and CO2 you can produce CH4, methane, and oxygen O2. So picking the right propellant is also important. Um, that sort of, if you think of this as maybe there's this three main choices. Um, and they have, the, they have their merits, but um, kerosene or rocket propellant grade kerosene, which is also what uh, jets use. Uh, ro rockets use a very expensive form, a highly refined form of, of jet fuel, essentially, which is a form of kerosene. The, the, it helps keep the vehicle size small, uh, but uh, because it's, it's a very specialized form of jet fuel, it's, it's quite expensive. Uh, the uh, reusability potential is lower. Um, very difficult to make this on Mars because there's no oil. Um, so really quite difficult to make the propellant on Mars. Um, and, um, and then propellant transfers is, is, is pretty good, but not, not great. Hydrogen, although it has a high specific impulse, um, is, uh, is very expensive, incredibly difficult to, to keep from boiling off because liquid hydrogen is very close to absolute zero um, as, as a liquid. So the insulation required is, is tremendous and the, uh, um, the, the cost of, uh, the, en the energy cost on Mars of producing and storing hydrogen is very high. So when we looked at the overall system optimization, uh, it was clear to us that, um, that methane actually was the, the, the clear winner. Um, so we, um, it, it would require maybe anywhere from you know, 50 to 60% of the energy on Mars to, re to uh, 
refill propellants uh, using the, the propellant depot, and, and just the, the technical challenges are a lot easier. So, so we think we think methane is actually better on uh, you know, just really almost across the board. Um, and, and we started off initially thinking that hydrogen would make sense, but ultimately came to the conclusion that the, the best way to optimize the cost of unit mass to Mars and back um, is, is to use an all methane system, or, or technically deep cryo methylogs. So those are the four, the four elements that need to be achieved. So, this, so who, um, whatever, whatever uh, system is designed, uh, whether by SpaceX or, or, or anyone, we think these are the four features that need to be addressed in order for the system to, to really achieve a, a low cost per, a cost per ton to the surface of Mars. And this is a, this is a simulation of the overall system.
what you saw there is is really uh, quite close to what we will actually build. Uh, it will look almost exactly what you saw, like what you saw. Um, so this is not 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 an artist's impression. These um, the, the simulation was actually made from the, the SpaceX engineering CAD models. So this is not you know it's not just well this is what it might look like. This is what we plan to try to make it look like. Um, so in, in the video, you, you, you got a sense for what the system architecture looks like. The, the rocket booster and the spaceship um, take off, loads the, the spaceship into orbit. The rocket booster then comes back. It comes back quite quickly, um, within about 20 minutes. Um, and so it, it can actually launch the, 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 the tanker version of the spacecraft, which is essentially the same as the, as the spaceship. Uh, but filling up the, the um, unpressurized and pressurized cargo areas with propellant tanks. Uh, so they look almost identical. So this, this also helps lower the, the development cost, which obviously will not be small. Um, and, uh, and then the, the propellant tanker goes up, and it'll go, actually up, it'll go up multiple times, so anywhere from three to five times to fill the tanks of the, of the spaceship in orbit. Um, and then once the, the spaceship is, the tanks are full, the cargo has been transferred, and uh, we reach the Mars rendezvous timing, which, uh, as mentioned, is roughly every 26 months. That's when the ship would depart. Now, um, over time, there would be many spaceships. You'd ultimately have, I think, upwards of 1,000 or more spaceships waiting in orbit. And so that the Mars colonial fleet would depart en masse. Um, they're kind of like Battlestar Galactica. You've seen that thing. That's a good, good show. Um, so it, a bit like that. Um, but it, it actually makes sense to, to load the spaceships into orbit um, because you've got two years to do so, and then make frequent use of the booster and the tanker to get, get really heavy reuse out of those. And then with the, with the spaceship, you get less reuse because you have to say, well, how long is it going to last? Well, maybe 30 years. So that might be 12 to maybe 15 uh, flights of the spaceship um, at most. Um, so you really want to maximize the cargo of the spaceship um, and and, and reuse the booster and the, the, the tanker um, a, a lot. So the, the, the ship goes to Mars, gets, gets profound, replenished, um, and then returns to Earth. So I'll go into some of the details of the vehicle design and performance. And I, I'm, I'm going to gloss over, uh, or just, I'll, I'll, I'll only talk um, a little bit about the, the technical details in the actual presentation. And then I'll leave the, the detailed technical questions to the, to the Q&A that follows. This is to give you a, a sense of size. So it's quite big. And I mean, the funny thing is, I think in the, in the long term, the strips will be even bigger than this. I, I think that this will represent, this will be relatively small compared to the Mars um, interplanetary ships of the, of the future. Um, and, but it kind of needs to be about the size, because if, if, in order to, to fit 100 people or thereabouts in the pressurized section, plus carry uh, the luggage and uh, all of the unpressurized cargo to build propellant plants and build everything from um, iron foundries to pizza joints, to you name it, in the, but we need to carry a lot of, a lot of cargo. So it, it really needs to be roughly on this, on this order of magnitude, because if we say like the, the uh, let's say a minimum threshold for a self-sustaining uh, city on Mars or civilization would be a million people, well, and, and you can only go every two years. If you, if you, um, you know, if, if you have 100 people per ship, that's 10,000 trips. So I think at least 100 people per trip is, is the right order of magnitude, and I think we actually may end up expanding the, the, the crew section and, uh, and ultimately taking more like 200 or more people per flight in order to reduce the cost per person. So but, but it's, it's, you know, 10,000 flights is, is a lot of flights. Um, so you really want, ultimately, I think, on the order of 1,000 ships. It would take a while to build up to 1,000 ships. and so I think if you say, when, when would we reach that million-person threshold from the point at which the first 
go, ship goes to Mars, it's probably sort of between 20 to 50 um, total Mars rendezvous. So it's, it's, it's probably somewhere between you know, maybe 40 to 100 years uh, to achieve a, a fully self-sustaining civilization on Mars. So that's the sort of a cross section of the ship. And um, you know, in some ways, it's not that complicated, really. Um, the, uh, it's made primarily of an advanced carbon fiber. Uh, the, the carbon fiber part is tricky when dealing with uh, deep cryogens and, um, and trying to achieve uh, both liquid and gas impermeability and, have, and not have uh, gaps uh, occur uh, due to cracking or pressurization that would make the carbon fiber leaky. So this is, this is a fairly significant technical challenge to make uh, deeply cryogenic tanks out of carbon fiber. Um, and it's only recently that, uh, the, that we think that the, the carbon fiber technology um, has gone to the point where, where we can actually do this with, without having to create a liner, on the ins uh, some sort of metal liner or other liner on the inside of the, the tanks, which would add mass and complexity. So it's particularly tricky for the hot gaseous oxygen uh, pressurization. So this, this is designed to be autogenously pressurized, which means that the, the fuel and the oxygen, um, we, we gasify them through heat exchanges in the engine and use that to pressurize the tanks. So we'll gasify the methane and, and use that to pressurize the fuel tank, gasify the oxygen, use that to pressurize the oxygen tank. And this compares, this is a much simpler system than what we have with, with Falcon 9 where we use um, helium for pressurization and we use uh, uh, nitrogen for gas thrusters. Uh, in this case, we would autogenously pressurize and then use gaseous uh, methane and uh, oxygen for the control thrusters. So really, only, you only need two ingredients for this as opposed to uh, four in the case of uh, Falcon 9 and actually five if you consider the ignition um, uh, liquid. Um, so we, we use was a, 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 a sort of complicated liquid to ignite the engines that, that isn't isn't very reusable. In this, in this case, we would use uh, spark ignition. Um, so this gives you a sense of vehicles by performance, um, sort of current and, and historic. I hope you can actually read that, but. Um, in, in expandable mode, uh, the, the, the vehicle purse that we're proposing would do about 550 tons and about 300 tons in reusable mode. Uh, that compares to Saturn V uh, max capability of, of 135 tons. Uh, but I think this, uh, this really gives a better sense for things. Um, the, the white bars show the performance of the vehicle, like in, in other words, the payload to orbit of the vehicle. So you can see, essentially, what, what it represents is what's the size efficiency of, of, the, of the vehicle. Um, and most rockets, including ours, our, ours that are currently flying, the, the performance um, bar is only a small percentage of the actual size of the rocket. Um, but with uh, the interplanetary system, with, um, which will initially be used for Mars, um, we've been able to um, or we believe, massively improve the design performance. So it's the first time a rocket's sort of performance bar will actually exceed the physical size of the rocket. This gives you a more direct sort of comparison. Um, this is, uh, the, the thrust level is, is quite enormous. Um, we're talking about uh, a lift off thrust of 13,000 tons. This will be quite, quite tectonic when it takes off. Um, but it does, it does um, fit on a Pad 39A, uh, which NASA has been kind of to allow us to use, where, because um, uh, they, they somewhat oversized the, the pad in doing Saturn V, and, and as a result, we can actually do a much larger vehicle on that same launch pad. And in the future, we expect to ha add additional uh, launch locations, probably. Um, probably adding one in, in, on the south coast of Texas. Uh, but this gives you a sense of the, the relative capability, if you, if you can read those. 
Um, but yeah, these, these vehicles have very different purposes. Uh, it, the, the, this, this is really intended to carry huge numbers of people, um, ultimately millions of tons of cargo to Mars. So you really need something quite large in order to do that. So talk about some of the key elements of the um, interplanetary spaceship and rocket booster. Um, we, we decided to start off the development uh, with uh, what we think are, are probably the two uh, most difficult elements of the of the design. One is the, the Raptor engine, um, and um, th this is going to be the, the highest chamber pressure uh, engine of any, any kind ever built, and probably the highest uh, thrust to weight. Um, it's a, it's a full-flow stage combustion engine, uh, which maximizes the theoretical uh, momentum that you can get out of a, a given source fuel and, and, and oxidizer. Uh, we we subcool the oxygen and methane to densify it. So compared to uh, when, it, when propellants are normally used, they're used close to their boiling point in, in most rockets. In, in our case, we, we actually load the propellants close to their freezing point, and that can result in a density improvement of up to around 10 to 12 percent, which makes an enormous difference in the in the actual results of the rocket. Um, it, it also makes the it gets rid of any cavitation risk for the turbo pumps, and it makes it easier to feed a high pressure turbo pump if you have very cold propellant. Um, really, one of the keys here, though, is the the uh, vacuum version of Raptor. Um, having a 382 second ISP. Th this is really quite critical to, to the whole Mars mission. Um, and we're confident we, we can get to, to that number, or at least within a few seconds of that number, ultimately maybe exceeding it slightly. So the rocket, the rocket booster, in many ways, is, is really a scaled up version of the Falcon 9 booster. Um, you'll see a lot of similarities, such as the grid fins. Um, obviously clustering a lot of engines at the base. And uh, the, the big difference really being that the, the primary structure is uh, an advanced form of carbon fiber as opposed to aluminum lithium. Um, and that we use autogenous pressurization um, and, um, and, and, and we get rid of the, the helium and the, the nitrogen. So this uses 42 Raptor engines. Um, it's a lot of engines, but uh, we use an iron on a Falcon 9, and with Falcon Heavy, which should launch early next year, uh, there's, there's uh, 27 engines on the base. So we've got pretty good experience with having a large number of engines. It also gives us redundancy, so that if some of the engines fail, um, you can still continue the mission and be fine. Um, but the main job of, this, of the booster is to accelerate the spaceship to around um, 8,500 kilometers an hour. Um, and, uh, for, for those that are less familiar with orbital dynamics, really it's, it's all about velocity and, and not about height. Um, so that really that's the job of the, the booster. The booster is like the javelin thrower. So sort of, it's got to toss that javelin, which is the, the, the spaceship. And uh, in the case of um, other planets, though, uh, which, have, which have a gravity well which is not as deep, uh, so Mars, of the moons of Jupiter, um, conceivably one day maybe even Venus. Uh, the, the, well, Venus will be a little trickier, but um, for, for most of the solar system, uh, you only need the spaceship. So you don't, you don't need the booster if you have a lower gravity well. So no booster is needed on the moon or Mars or any of the moons of Jupiter or Pluto. Uh, you just need the spaceship. The booster is just there for heavy gravity wells. Um, and then we've, we've also been able to optimize the propellant needed for boost back and landing uh, to get it down to about 7% um, of the liftoff uh, prop propellant load. And um, we think with some optimization, maybe we can get it down to about 6%. And we are also are now getting quite comfortable with the accuracy of the landing. Um, if you've been watching the, the Falcon 9 landings, you'll see that they're getting increasing, increasingly closer to, to the bullseye. And we think particularly with the, with the addition of additional, with addition of some uh, thrusters, some maneuvering thrusters, we can actually put the booster right back on the launch stand. And then those, those fins at the base are essentially centering features 
uh, to uh, take out any minor uh, position mismatch uh, at the lower side. So it looks like at the base. Um, so we, th we think we only need to uh, control or steer the, the center cluster of engines. So there's, there's seven engines in the center cluster. Those would be the ones that, that move for steering the rocket, and the other ones would be fixed in position, uh, which gives us the, the best concentration of, of, we can max out the number of engines because we don't have to leave any room for um, gimbling or moving the engines. And, and like I said, this is all designed so that you could actually lose multiple engines um, e even at liftoff or anywhere in flights and continue the mission safely. So the, for the spaceship itself, um, in the top uh, we have the, the, the pressurized compartment. I'll show you a fly through of that in a moment. Um, then beneath that is, the, is where we'd have the unpressurized cargo, which would be really flat packed in a very dense format. And, um, and then below that is the liquid oxygen tank. Um, the, the liquid oxygen tank is probably the hardest piece of this whole uh, vehicle, because uh, it's, it's got to handle propellant at the coldest level, um, and, it, and the tanks themselves actually form the, for, form the airframe. So the, the airframe structure and the tank structure are combined, um, as it is in, in, in all modern rockets. Um, and uh, in, in aircraft, for example, the, the, the wing is really a fuel tank in, in wing shape. Um, so the, the, um, it has to take the, 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 the thrust loads of ascent, the loads of, of reentry, um, and, um, and then it has to be impermeable to uh, gaseous oxygen, which is, which is tricky, and, and non-reactive to gaseous oxygen. So, so that's, the, that's the hardest piece of, of, the, of the spaceship itself, which is actually why we started on that element uh, as well, and I'll show you some pictures of that later. So, and then below the uh, oxygen tank is the, the fuel tank, and then the engines are mounted directly to the, the, the thrust cone on the base. Um, and then there, there, are, there are six of the vacuum, the high-efficiency vacuum engines, um, around the perimeter, and those are, those those don't gimbal, and and then there are three of the sea level versions of the engine which uh, do gimbal and provide the steering. Although we can do uh, some some amount of steering if you're in space by with differential thrust on the uh, outside engines. Uh, the net effect is uh, a cargo to um, Mars of, of up to 450 tons, depending upon how many um, uh, refills you do with the the, the tanker. And the goal is at least 100 passengers per ship, although I think ultimately we'll probably see that number grow to 200 or more. Uh, this, this chart's a little difficult to interpret at first, but I, I kind of, we decided to put it there for people who want to watch the video afterwards and, and sort of take a closer look and analyze some of the numbers. Um, the, the, the column on the left is probably what's most relevant, um, and that's, that gives you the trip time. So depending upon which uh, Earth Mars rendezvous you're aiming for, the trip time um, at six kil kilometers per second departure velocity can be as low as 80 days. Um, and then over time, I think we'd obviously improve that. Um, and um, ultimately, I suspect um, that you'd, you'd see Mars transit times of as little as 30 days in, in the more distant future. So it's, it's fairly manageable considering the trips that people used to do in the old days that routinely take uh, sailing voyages that would be six months or more. So on arrival, the, the heat shield technology is, is, is extremely important. Um, we've been refining the, the heat shield technology using our Dragon spacecraft, um, and we now have, uh, we're now on version three of uh, PICA, which is phenolic impregnated carbon ablator. Um, and it's getting more and more robust with each new version, um, with, with less ablation, more resistance, um, less need for refurbishment. The heat shield is basically a giant brake pad. So it's like how good can you make that brake pad against extreme reentry conditions and minimize the, the, the cost of refurbishment um, and, and make it so that you can have many flights with no refurbishment at all. So this is a flight through of the the crew compartment.
want to give you a sense of what it would feel like to, to actually be in the spaceship. Um, I mean, in order to make it appealing um, and, and increase that portion of the Venn diagram of people who actually want to go, um, it's got to be really fun and exciting, um, and it, it can't feel cramped or, um, or boring. So uh, the, the, crew, the crew compartment or the occupant compartment is set up so that you can do zero-G games, you can float around, uh, there'll be like movies, uh, lecture halls, um, you know, cabins, um, a restaurant. It'll be like really fun to go. You're gonna have a great time. So for the, the propellant plant on Mars, um, again, this is one of those slides that um, I, I won't go into in, in, in detail here, but people can think about uh, offline. The, the key point being that the ingredients are there on Mars to uh, create a propellant plant with relative ease. Because the, the atmosphere is primarily CO2, um, and there's water ice almost everywhere, you've got the, the CO2 plus H2O to make methane CH4 and oxygen O2 um, using the Sabatier reaction. Um, the, 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 the trickiest thing really is the, the energy source, which we think we can do with a large field of, of, of uh, solar panels. Uh, so then to give you a sense of the cost, really, really the key is, uh, is making this affordable to uh, almost anyone who wants to go. And we think um, based on this architecture, um, this architecture assuming optimization over time, like the very first flights wouldn't be, would be fairly expensive, but the architecture allows for a cost per ticket um, of less than $200,000. Maybe as less, maybe as little as $100,000 um, over time, depending upon how much mass a person takes. So we're right now um, estimating about $140,000 per ton to the surface of Mars. So if a person plus the luggage is less than that, um, taking into account food consumption um, and life support, then uh, we, we think that the, the cost of, a, of moving to Mars ultimately could drop below $100,000. So funding, these are our, sort of our funding sources. <laughs> and um, so we've got Steel Underpants, uh, Launch Satellites, uh, Send Cargo to Space Station, Kickstarter, of course, um, followed by Profit. So the, uh, obviously it's going to be a challenge to, to fund this, this whole endeavor. Um, uh, we, we do expect to generate um, pretty decent uh, net, net cash flow from launching lots of satellites and servicing the space station from NASA, transferring cargo to and from the space station. Um, and, um, and then uh, I know that there's, there's a lot of people in the private sector who are interested in helping fund uh, a base on Mars. Um, and then perhaps there'll be uh, interest on, on, on the government sector side to also do that. Um, ultimately, this is going to be uh, a huge uh, public-private partnership, um, and I think that's 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 how um, the United States was established, um, and uh, many other countries around the world is a public-private partnership. So I think that's probably what what occurs. And right now, we're just trying to make as much progress as we can with the resources that that we have available, um, and just sort of keep keep moving ball forward, um, and hopefully. Um, I think, I think as we as we show that this is possible, that this dream is real, um, not just a dream, it can, it can so something that can be made real. Um, I think the support will snowball over time, um, and I should say also that um, the, the main reason I'm personally accumulating assets is in order to fund this. So I, I really don't have any other motivation for personally accumulating assets uh, except to be able to make the the biggest contribution I can to um, making life multiplanetary. <laughs> Timelines. Not the best at this sort of thing. <laughs> but. Um, just to show you where we started off, um, in 2002, SpaceX basically consisted of 
carpet and a mariachi band. That, that was it. That's, that's, that's all of SpaceX in 2002. Um, as you can see, I'm a dancing machine. Um, and uh, yeah, I believe in kicking off celebratory events with mariachi bands. I really like mariachi bands. <laughs> so, um, but but that, that, that was what we started off with in 2002. Um, and, and really, I, I mean, I thought we had maybe a 10% chance of, of, of doing anything, um, of even getting a rocket to orbit, let alone getting beyond that and, and, and taking Mars uh, seriously. Uh, but um, I, I came to the conclusion that if, 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 there were, if there wasn't some new entrant into, um, in, into the space arena um, w with a strong ideological motivation, uh, then it, it didn't seem like we were on a trajectory to ever <laughs> Uh, be a space bearing civilization and, and be out there among the stars. Um, because, you know, in 69 we were able to go to the moon and the space shuttle could get to low Earth orbit and then obviously the space shuttle got retired, but, but that trend line is down, down to zero. So um, I think what a lot of people don't appreciate is that technology does not automatically improve. It, it, it only improves if, if a lot of really strong engineering talent um, a, a, is applied to the problem. Um, th that it improves. Um, and there are many examples in history where civilizations have reached a certain technology level and then ha have fallen well below that and, and, um, and then re recovered only millennia later. So we go from 2002, uh, where we're basically we're, we're clueless, um, and then and, and felt with Falcon 1, the smallest useful orbital rocket that we could think of, which would deliver half a ton to orbit. Um, and then four years later, we developed the, um, we built the, the, first, the first vehicle. So we developed the main engine, the upper stage engine, the, the, the airframes, the fairing, and, and the, the launch system. And had our first attempt at launch in 2006, uh, which failed. <laughs> so that, that lasted about 60 seconds, unfortunately. Um, uh, but, but, 2006, uh, four years after starting, is also when we, we actually got our, our first uh, NASA contract. Um, and I just want to say I'm in incredibly grateful to NASA for supporting SpaceX, um, you know, despite the fact that our rocket crashed. Um, it was awesome. I, I, I'm NASA's biggest fan. Um, so, yeah, thank, thank you very much to the people that had the faith to do that. Thank you. So then, um, 2006, uh, followed by a lot of grief, um, and then uh, finally the fourth launch of Falcon 1 uh, worked in 2008, and we were re really down to our last pennies. Uh, in fact, I only thought I had enough money for three launches, and the first three bloody failed, um, and uh, we were able to scrape together enough to just barely make it and do, do a fourth launch, um, and that, thank, thank goodness that uh, fourth launch succeeded um, in 2008. Um, that was a lot of pain. And, uh, and then also at the end of 2008 is when, when NASA awarded us the first, the first major uh, operational contract, uh, which was for resupplying cargo uh, to the space station and bringing cargo back. Um, then a couple of years later, we did the first launch of uh, Falcon 9, uh, version 1. Um, and that had about a, a, a 10 ton to uh, orbit capability, so it was about 20 times the capability of Falcon 1, um, and also was designed to, to carry our Dragon spacecraft. Um, then 20, 2010 is uh, our first uh, uh, mission to the space station, so we were able to, to uh, finish development of Dragon and uh, dock with the space station in 2010. Um, so, uh, sorry, 20, sorry, 2010 is expendable, expendable Dragon, expendable Dragon. 2012 is when we uh, delivered and returned cargo from the space station. Uh, 2013 is when we first started doing a vote of takeoff and landing tests. Um, and then 2014 is when um, we were able to have the first orbital booster do a soft landing in the ocean. The landing was soft, uh, that fell over and exploded, but um, landing for seven seconds, it was good. <laughs> um, and, and we also improved the capability of the vehicle uh, from uh, 10 tons to about uh, um, 13 tons to Leo. 
Um, and then 2015, or last year, uh, in December, uh, that was definitely one of the best moments of my life when the Rocket Booster came back and landed at, at Cape Canaveral. Um, so that was really, yeah. Uh, So I think that, that really showed that we could bring um, an orbit-class booster back from a very high velocity um, all the way to um, the launch site um, and land it safely um, and, um, and, and with, with almost no refurbishment required for reflight. And if, if things go well, we we're hoping to uh, refly one of landed boosters in a, in a few months. Um, so yeah, and then 2016, we also demonstrated landing on, on a ship. Um, the landing on the ship is important for the very high velocity geosynchronous missions um, and um, that's, that's important for reasonability of, of uh, Falcon 9 because um, about uh, yeah, roughly a quarter of our missions are, are, are sort, of, sort of servicing the space station um, and then there's a few other low Earth orbit missions but most of our missions, probably 60% you know, of our missions are commercial geo missions. So uh, we've got to do these high velocity missions that really need to uh, land on a ship out to sea. They don't have enough uh, propellants on board to boost back to the, the launch site. So looking into the future, uh, next steps. Um, we were kind of intentionally a bit fuzzy about this timeline. <laughs> um, but the, we're, going to, we're going to try to make as much progress as we can. Obviously, it's with a very constrained budget, um, but we're going to try to make as much progress as we can on the, uh, the elements of the interplanetary transport uh, booster and spaceship, um, and, uh, and, and hopefully we'll be able to, do, to complete the first um, uh, development uh, spaceship in maybe about four years and start doing um, suborbital flights with, with that. Uh, in fact, it actually has enough capability that you could maybe even go to orbit uh, with, if you limit the amount of cargo with the spaceship. Uh, but well, you have to really you just have to really strip it down. But in, in, in tanker form, it can definitely get to orbit. Um, can't get back. <laughs> we can get to orbit. Um, uh, it actually starts thinking like maybe there is some market for really fast transport of stuff around the world, um, provided we can land somewhere where noise is not a super big deal. Um, the rockets are very noisy, uh, but we, we, we could transport cargo to anywhere on Earth um, in 45 minutes at the, at the longest. So most places on Earth would be maybe 20, 25 minutes. So um, you know, maybe if we had a floating platform out off the coast of, um, you know, say uh, off the coast of New York, uh, say 20, 30 miles out, you could go from um, you know, New York to Tokyo in, I don't know, 25 minutes. Um, across the Atlantic in 10 minutes. As, um, really, most of your time would be getting to the ship. Um, and then there'd be real quick after that. So there's some, some intriguing possibilities there, um, although we're not, we're not counting on that. And then, uh, and then development of the booster. We actually think the booster part is, is relatively straightforward because we've it, it's, it amounts to um, a scaling up of the Falcon 9 booster. Um, so there's, we don't see a lot of sort of showstoppers there. Um, yeah, so, so then, but then trying to put it all together um, and, and, and make this actually work for Mars. If, if things go super well, it might be kind of in the 10 year time frame. Um, but um, that there's, there's a, I, I don't want to say that's when, when it will occur. It's like there's a huge amount of risk. Um, it's it's going to cost a lot. Um, good chance we don't succeed, but we're, we're going to do our best um, and, and try to make as much progress as, as possible. Um, yeah. Oh, and, and we're going to try to send something to Mars on every Mars rendezvous from here on out. So. Uh, Dragon 2, which is a propulsive lander, uh, we plan to send to Mars in, um, in, in a couple of years and, uh, and then do probably another Dragon mission in 2020. In fact, we want to, 
establish a steady cadence that there's always uh, a flight leaving, like a train leaving the station. Um, with every Mars rendezvous, we will be trans we will be sending a dragon, at least a dragon to Mars, and ultimately the big spaceship. So, if there are people that are interested in putting payloads on on Dragon, um, you know you can count on uh, a ship that's going to transport something on the order of, of um, at least uh, two or three tons of useful payload to the surface of Mars. Yeah, so that's, that, that's part of the reason why we designed Dragon 2 to be a propulsive lander, is as a propulsive lander, you can, you can go anywhere in the solar system. Um, so you could go to the moon, you could go to, well, anywhere really. Um, whereas uh, if something relies on parachutes or wings, um, then you can pretty much only, well, if it's, if it's uh, wings, you can pretty much only land on Earth because you need a runway. And most places don't have a runway. Um, and then any place that doesn't have a dense atmosphere, you can't use parachutes. So, but propulsive works um, anywhere. So, so Dragon should be capable of landing on any uh, solid or liquid surface in the, in the solar system. Um, and then I was, I was really excited to see that uh, the team managed to uh, do the uh, all-up uh, Raptor engine firing in advance of this uh, conference. Um, the, the, I just want to say thanks to, to the Raptor team uh, for really working seven days a week to try to get this done uh, in advance of the, of the presentation. Um, so I, I really wanted to show that we've made some hardware progress in this direction. And, um, and, and the, the Raptor is a really tricky engine. It's, it's a lot trickier than, than Molin uh, because it's a full flow stage combustion, much higher pressure. Um, and um, I'm kind of amazed it didn't blow up on the first firing, uh, but it, fortunately it, it, was, uh, it was good. It's kind of interesting to see the mock diamonds forming. Um, yeah. So the, um, it, it part, and, and part of the reason for making the engine sort of small, like Raptor, although it has three times the thrust of a Merlin, um, is actually only about the same size as a Merlin engine because it has three times the operating pressure. Um, and that means we can use a lot of the production techniques that we've honed with Merlin. We're currently producing Merlin engines at uh, almost 300 per year. So we understand how to make uh, rocket engines in volume. Uh, so even though the, the Mars vehicle uses 42 on the base and nine on the upper stage, um, so we're 51 engines to, to make, um, that, that's well within our production capabilities for Merlin. Um, and this is a similarly, similarly sized engine to Merlin, ex except for the expansion ratio. Um, so we feel really comfortable about being able to make this engine in volume at, uh, at, at a price that doesn't, doesn't break our budget. Um, and then uh, we also wanted to make progress on the primary structure. So, um, as I mentioned, this, this is really qu a very difficult um, thing to make, uh, is, is to make something out of carbon fiber. Even though carbon fiber has incredible strength to weight, um, when, when you want, want to then put um, uh, super uh, cold liquid oxygen and liquid methane, particularly partic liquid oxygen, in, in the tank, um, it's subject to, to cracking um, and leaking, um, and it's, uh, it's a very difficult thing to make. It just the sheer scale of it is, is also challenging because you've, you've got to lay up the carbon fiber in exactly the right way on a huge mold, and you've got to cure that mold at temperature, um, and, uh, and then, it's, 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 and then it's, it's just really hard to make large, large carbon fiber structures that, that can do all of those things and carry incredible loads. Um, so, so that's that's the other thing we wanted to focus on was the Raptor, and then building the first uh, uh, development tank for the Mars spaceship. So, um, yeah, like I said, this 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 is the, this is really the hardest part of the of the spaceship. The other pieces are 
we, um, we have a pretty good handle on, but this was the, the trickiest one. So we wanted to tackle it first. You get a size for how big the tank is. Um, it's really, really quite big. Um, also, big congratulations to the team uh, that worked on that. They also were working seven days a week to, to try to get this done uh, in advance of the IAC. Um, and um, so that we managed to build the first tank. Um, and uh, the initial tests with the cryogenic propellant actually look quite, quite positive. We, we have not seen um, any leaks or, or major issues. This is what the, the tank looks like on, on the inside. So you can get a, get a real sense for how much, just how big this, this, this tank is. Um, the, it, it's actually completely smooth on the inside, but the way that the carbon fiber applies lay up and reflect the light makes it look, look faceted. So then what about uh, Beyond Mars? So as we thought about the system, and the reason we call it a system, because generally I don't like calling things systems because everything's a system, including your dog. Um, the, is, that, um, is that it's actually more than a vehicle. Um, there's, there's obviously the rocket booster, the spaceship, uh, the tanker, and the propellant uh, plant, the, um, the in-situ propellant production. Um, if you have all of those four elements, um, you, you can actually go anywhere in the solar system by, by, by planet hopping or, or moon hopping. So by establishing a propellant depot on in the asteroid belt or on one of the moons of Jupiter, um, you can go to, you can make flights uh, from uh, Mars to Jupiter, no problem. Uh, in fact, even from, even without a propellant depot at Mars, you can, you can do a flyby of, of Jupiter uh, without a propellant depot. Um, so, but, but by establishing a propellant depot, um, uh, let's say, you know, Enceladus or Europa or, or any of this, a few, few options, um, and then doing another one on Titan, uh, Jupiter, uh, Saturn's moon, um, and then perhaps another one uh, further out um, on Pluto uh, or elsewhere in the solar system. Um, th this system really gives, gives you freedom to go anywhere you want in the greater solar system. So you can actually travel out to the Kuiper Belt, to the Earth cloud, um, I wouldn't recommend this for um, interstellar journeys, but uh, this, uh, this, this basic system, provided we have filling stations along the way, um, is, means full access to the entire greater solar system. It would be really great to do a mission to Europa, particularly. So. All right, so uh, any, any questions that I can answer? Hello. I yeah, Derek Stamos. I can't see a thing, by the way, so. Anyway, I'll just add, I want to try to look at you, I'll just hear the disembodied voice. Okay, uh, uh, Derek Stamos of nasaspaceflight.com. Okay. Can you talk a little bit about, uh, from the video, it looks like Launch Complex 39A is going to be initial launch site. Can you talk about some of the initial test flights, modifications to the pad, and where the booster and spacecraft may be built? Sorry, I think maybe you speak a little bit louder. Sure. Uh, the video showed launching from Launch Complex 39. Uh, can you talk a little bit about initial test flights, booster construction site, and where the spacecraft may be built, as it seems to be too large to transport by road or any other terrestrial uh, transport? Um, yeah, so we, we are expecting to do the um, initial flights from 39A. Um, so we're, setting, we're planning to set up 39A such that it can launch either Falcon Heavy um, or um, the uh, interplanetary uh, system. Um, the, uh, it, it's, it's quite a big launch site, so I think we, uh, we, we, we can do that. In terms of construction of the, uh, the ship and booster, uh, you're right, it is quite big, not something you can really transport on the roads. So the, uh, I, I think we would probably 
look at construction of the the booster and the spacecraft. Um, it's, we're actually looking at uh, Mashhud, um, Louisiana, as one of the possibilities. Um, and um, but but I, I think we would end up um, constructing the booster and spacecraft uh, in, in probably multiple states, and and then perhaps doing final assembly at the launch site. Thank you. Right here. Hi, Alan. Right here in front of you. I'll jump. Okay, great. Um, it's very nice to meet you. My name is Aldo. And uh, three weeks ago, I was at Burning Man in the Nevada desert. Great. And it felt like I was in Mars. It was a dusty storm, and it was really cold at night, and there was no water. But there was one problem at Burning Man. With a population of only 75,000, there was a lot of shit. And there was no water to take it into the rivers, which is kind of what we do today in our current sanitation system. So I was like, is this what Mars is going to be like? Just a dusty, waterless shitstorm? So I was like, hey, Ellen, are you working on a sustainable sanitation? Are we going to have a toilet in Mars that doesn't use water? Today on Earth, there's three billion people that don't have a Guys, toilet. Guys, I actually have to say, we have to keep the, the, it, it, no essays, only questions. All right, so are you working on a toilet for Mars? <laughs> yeah, um, it, it, I think um, Mars actually has a huge amount of water and water ice, so I don't think we'll really uh, suffer a, a water so shortage in Mars. The main thing about Mars is actually going to be energy. Um, if you have energy, there's plenty of water because there's, there's massive amounts of ice. Uh, so it's really just about um, getting huge numbers of uh, solar panels out there and potentially doing uh, geothermal um, energy. Um, and you know, ultimately, um, I think assuming the public is receptive, we, you know, there might be nuclear. I think certainly if you build nuclear on Mars as to whether you transport nuclear to Mars would be you know, kind of up, up to the public to decide. All right, next question. Um. I'm uh, George Lardos from MIT SDM and MIT GSLI. Uh, Elon, the first humans on Mars will be in the history books, as we all know. Who should these uh, men and women be? Maybe children, too. Who should these people be carrying the light of humanity to Mars for all of us? Thank you. Well, I, th I think the first journeys to Mars are going to be really very dangerous. Um, uh, the risk of fatality will be high. Um, there's just no way around it. Uh, so I would not suggest having sending children, or um, it would be basically, are you prepared to die? Then if that's okay, then, then you know, you're a candidate for going. <laughs> um, but, but really, this is, this is less about, like, you know, who goes there first, or it, it's, the thing that really matters is making a, um, a self-sustaining civilization on Mars as fast as possible. It, it, this is different from Apollo. This is, you know, um, this is really about um, minimizing existential risk um, and, um, and and having a tremendous sense of adventure. I mean, the thing that um, Mars really represents, I mean, th there's the whole life insurance and protecting life and ensuring that the light of consciousness is not extinguished, which I think is incredibly important. Um, you know, backing up the biosphere. Um, and to be clear, this is not about everyone moving to Mars, it's about becoming multi-planetary. I think Earth will be a good place for a long time. Um, but, uh, but, but it's just, it's the probable lifespan of human civilization will be much greater if we're a multi-planet species. Now that's the defensive argument, but the, the, the argument that I actually find most compelling um, is, that it, is that it would be an incredible adventure. I think it would be the most inspiring thing that I could possibly imagine. And life needs to be more than just solving problems every day. You need to wake up and be excited about the future uh, and be inspired and, and want to live. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hey, hey Elon, Nick Rocket, New Space Global, you're the best. Everybody get up for Elon, please. This guy inspires the shit out of us. Come on. I've got a gift for you. It's a comic book called The Future of Fusion. It's about the first man on Mars. Okay. Looks like you. I can't get past El Chapo's militia, though. So I don't know, should I just throw this onto the stage? 
Sorry? My question is, can I give you this gift? Um, sure, if you, you had, yeah. It's the future of fusion. <laughs> thank you, sir. All right, thank you. Hi, Elon. Lauren Grush from The Verge. Um, you talk about how the Mars colonization architecture is meant to serve as a backup okay. plan. Man, there's so many mics here. Yeah, if you can see me. Okay. The Mars architecture is supposed to serve as a backup plan for humanity, but you didn't touch much on how you will keep humans safe on the way over there from either deep space radiation or how they will live on the planet. Can you give, give us some insight into the life support systems, habitats, stuff like that? Uh, sure. Well, I, I mean, the, the, you know, my view on the radiation thing is that there, there's certainly some risk of radiation, um, but it's not, it's not, um, it's not deadly. Um, there will be some slight increased risk of, uh, of, of cancer, uh, but it's, it's, I think, relatively minor. Um, you, you need to have some shielding, particularly if there's a solar flare um, or, or sort of a big, uh, it's any kind of sort of solar storm. We'd want to basically point the rocket at the, at the sun and, and maximize your shielding effect. Um, uh, you know, point the rear of the rocket at the sun so you maximize your shielding effect and, and have the passengers cluster around a, a column of water. Um, but I think the radiation risk there is, is relatively small. Once you're on Mars, obviously you, you cut your radiation in half just because you've got the planet shielding you, um, and then there's at least some atmosphere. Um, and I think um, then what, what you can construct over time is an artificial magnetic field um, to deflect uh, high energy particles. So I actually think the radiation thing is, is, is um, it's often brought up, but I think it's not, not uh, too big of a deal. The, um, and then there's what happens once, once people are there. Um, I mean, the, the goal of SpaceX is really to build the transport system. It's like building the Union Pacific Railroad. Um, and and, and once, once that transport system is built, um, then there's uh, a tremendous opportunity for anyone who wants to go to Mars and create um, something new or uh, um, build the, the foundations of a new planet. So it's like, who, who wants to sort of be, you know, among the founding members of a, of a new planet, uh, and, and like I said, built everything from iron refineries to, to the first pizza joint. They were, they were, you know, we want them all. Um, and then things on Mars that no people can't even imagine today that might be unique or would be unique to, to Mars. Um, and, um, but but that, that's, that's really where um, a tremendous amount of entrepreneurship and, and talent would flourish. Um, just, just as happened in California when the Union Pacific Railroad was completed. Um, and, and when they were building the Union Pacific, they, a lot of people said, well, that's a super dumb idea because there's, no, you know, there's hardly anybody lives in California. Um, but now, you know, today, we've got sort of the, at least the you know, US epicenter of technology development um, and entertainment, and, um, and it's, it's the biggest state in, in the nation. So, um, but you need that transport link. If you can't get there, and none of those opportunities exist. Uh, so, so our goal is just to make sure you can get there. Thank you. Okay. Hi, Elin. Apparently, I've like stepped off My the webcast. My name is Anastasia. <laughs> I'll pop back all the way. Okay. Uh, I would like to ask you the following thing. I'm Russian, and a lot of people here are from many different countries. You're going interplanetary, but you're not going international. When are you going to hire people from other countries than the US? Sure. Yeah, so I think people are a bit confused about this. Um, uh, unfortunately, it, it, this is not up to us. So the, the U.S. government regulations, um, uh, well, they make um, getting a job in the U.S. hard as it is, get just getting a job visa hard as it is. But if you're working on rocket technology, that's considered an advanced weapons technology. So even a normal work visa isn't sufficient um, unless you get um, a, a special permission from the Secretary of Defense and, uh, or, the, uh, or the Secretary of State. Um, so uh, I want to be clear, this is not some, out of some um, desire of SpaceX to just hire people with, with green cards. It's, it's because we're not allowed to do anything else. Um, and I, I mean, I, I think this is not a wise thing for, this is not a wise policy for, for uh, you know, for the U.S. because there's so many talented people all around the world uh, that we would love to have work at our company, um, but unless, the, uh, unless they can somehow get a green card, we can't. We're just uh, we're, we're 
legally prevented from, from hiring anyone. Um, but for example, this is not the case at Tesla. At Tesla, um, we're about, about uh, a quarter of our engineering team um, is from outside the US, and um, maybe even 30%, um, because we don't have the ITAR restriction. Um, so it'd be, I really wish we could do more, it's just our hands are tied. Thank you. Cool. Hey, Elon, so can't wait for the SpaceX uh, improbability drive. Um, looking forward to that. But you often talk about wanting to inspire the masses and kind of push technology forward for conquest. And I'm developing a series with Funny or Die, which is like the top online comedy site found by Will Ferrell. And it's about, quick questions, not essays. Yeah, yeah, quick questions. So it's about you sending someone to Mars, but kind of like that first monkey that got shot into space, they're never coming back. It's going to be a one-way trip. So uh, not you, necessarily. Well, maybe. So you mathematically determine the world's most expendable human being to make the journey, and that's Michael Sarah. So I wanted to see if this is like a project that you might have any interest in supporting. Um, Funny or Die just drove 31 million views to a like Hillary Clinton's Zach Galifianakis video a few days ago. I want to see if I, you might be able to talk about I, it after. I, 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 think, I think it's pretty important to give people the option of returning. Um, like the, 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 the number of people who will be willing to um, move to Mars is much greater if they know that they have the option of returning, um, even if they never actually return. Um, I mean, most of the people that went to the original English colonies in North America, they never returned to Europe even once. Um, but, but some did, and just knowing that if you don't like it there, that you can come back, um, I think makes a big difference in people's willingness to, to go there in the first place. Um, and in any case, we need the spaceship back, so it's, go it's coming. You can jump on board or not. It's cool. Yeah. You, get, you get a free return trip if you want. Oh. Hi, Elon. Cameron Ashgard here from the Outer Space Education Alliance. Um, over the years, we've watched in admiration as you've um, drawn up great blueprints of uh, how we are going to get to Mars. I'm just curious about what type of initiatives you have in mind for uh, answering the question of why and increasing public interest and in actually desiring to do such a thing that's so vast and uh, complex. No, I, I, exactly. That's, that's why I really want, I started off the, the talk by saying what really matters is the intersection of, sex, uh, uh, intersection of sets of people that want to go and can't afford to go. So the, um, anything that can be done to increase the desire of people to go, um, it, I think is a good thing. And there's, I mean, there's been a lot of uh, Mars shows, uh, Mars, you know, movies, um, and and there's some TV shows that I know that are getting um, written. Um, and you, you really want to create the the dream of Mars in people's minds and have it be like, you know, it's the new frontier, um, and it's and make it a, as exciting and fun and desirable as possible. Um, so I think this is where um, this is where the entertainment industry can play a huge role in just um, in just in just imagine, you know, putting putting that dream in people's heads, showing them what it can be like, um, and um, and I think this is really something that appeals to anybody with uh, with an exploratory spirit. Um, if 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 you if, if you're an explorer, if you, if you want to be on the frontier and and push the envelope, um, and, and you know, be where, where things are super exciting, even if it's dangerous. That's, I mean, that's really who we're appealing to here. Um, and uh, but I think anything that anyone here could do uh, in that direction would would, would be great. Um, getting people excited about going, um, getting the public behind this, um, and, 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 and the truth is, like right now on, on Earth. You can basically go anywhere in 24 hours. I mean, anywhere. Um, you, go, you can get, you can go, you can fly over the uh, Antarctic Pole and parachute out 24 hours from now if you want. Um, you, you can get, um, you can, you can get, get parachuted to the top of Mount Everest um, from the right plane, um, and the, you can go to the bottom of the ocean. Um, Earth, Earth, from a physical standpoint, you can go anywhere anywhere. Um, so there, there is no real physical frontier on Earth anymore, but space is, is that frontier. Um, and so I think it's going to appeal to anyone with that, with that exploratory spirit.
Thank you very much. Hey, hello, I'm Laura. Back here. Elan. Man, it's really hard to figure out where the <laughs> disembodied voice is coming um, from. Like, I was, I wanted to ask you, like, for some normal people like me, what would it take physically? Do you need some requirements or something to get to Mars? So, sorry, I, I can't hear you. Yeah, like, if normal people want to travel to Mars, do we need some specific requirements, or do normal people can go there? No, I mean, we're, we're trying to make it such that um, anyone can go. That, yeah, but, you know, we, do we need, like, a lot of training or something special? Nope. Maybe a few days of training. Yeah. Also... <laughs> I mean, <laughs> also, train more if you want. I wanted to ask you, in, in behalf of all the ladies, can I go upstairs and give you a kiss, a good luck kiss? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds, sounds, sounds great. I don't have them here, but I uh, uh, appreciate, thank you, appreciate the thought. <laughs> um. Hi, uh, Jeff House, Space News, over on, on your right. Uh, question on the resources. How much resources are you putting into this development right now in terms of funding, employees, and so on? And how do you expect that to change as the development of the booster and spaceship ramp up? Well, right now, the uh, resources that are being put into the interplanetary transport system are, are pretty low. I mean, certainly well under 5% of the company. Um, uh, and maybe uh, we're spending uh, a few tens of millions of dollars on it right now. So it's, it's relatively small. Um, and, but then as, as we um, finish development of the uh, sort of the, the, the final version of uh, Falcon 9, uh, which should, should be sometime next year, and Dragon uh, 2, um, and, and, and get the uh, reusability of the boost stage and reusability of Dragon 2 sorted out, then we'll, gra we'll gradually apply more and more resources to the interplanetary system. Um, and so hopefully over time we'll be able to um, have most of our engineering team, well we will, have, perhaps within um, a year and a half to two years, we should have most of SpaceX engineering working on the interplanetary system, um, and hopefully be able to spend maybe more on the order of of a couple hundred million dollars a year, maybe three hundred million dollars a year on on the system. Still, not a lot relative to the overall thing, um, and, and you know, in order to make this whole thing work and work reliably before it starts generating maybe some kind of positive cash flow, is I mean, it's probably an investment on the order of $10 billion. Um, so it's, you know, a lot of money to get there. Hi, Elon. Uh, my name is Zach. I'm a space enthusiast and a local idiot for Rooster Teeth. Um, and I was just wondering, you know, can you talk a little bit about the future of humans in space? And are you going to go to Mars? Because I, I would hate to put in all this work right. and then not go. Yeah, I, I would definitely, I would definitely like to go to orbit um, and maybe visit the space station, um, and then ultimately uh, uh, go to Mars. Um, um, yeah, I've got to make sure that if something goes wrong in the flight um, and you know I die, then um, you know that there's a good succession plan. Um, and that the mission of the company continues um, and, and that it doesn't somehow get taken over by uh, investors who just want to, you know, m maximize the, the profit of the company and not go to Mars. That would be my biggest fear in that situation. Thank you so much. Hi, Mr. Musk. This is Nancy Wolfson with Auto Space Education Alliance. And I know you've been talking about uh, getting to Mars. Can you, can you see me here? I can, yes. Okay. I, I, can, see, I can see your arms. Okay. <laughs> right here. Okay, so, and I know we need to get first to Mars, but I have a question. In the back of your head, have you been thinking about interstellar travel? Interstellar, yes. Um, I mean, I think if we were to do interstellar travel, the best way to do it would, would be with uh, kind of an antimatter drive. Um, that would give you the best, obviously, mass efficiency. It's difficult to beat uh, antimatter. 
Um, so, um, I, you know, but even in a best case scenario, that's really quite a long journey to even to get to proxy and Tori. I think um, the key thing is to establish a, a base on, on Mars. And as soon as there's a base on Mars, then there's a, a very powerful forcing function for improving uh, space transport technology. I mean, right now, there, there just isn't that forcing function, because all we do is, is, is very local stuff in, in, in Earth orbit. Um, so as soon as we've got a base on, on Mars, um, we can see even a base on the moon, but, but certainly a base on Mars, uh, that creates a very powerful forcing function for making space technology better and better every year. And, and, um, and that's ultimately what will lead us to uh, interstellar travel. Um, I think trying to do interstellar travel right off the bat um, is, would be very tricky. You know, sort of like uh, if, you're, if you're developing aircraft, you, you really want to first do the right flyer and then maybe get to a DC-3 and then a 707 and, a, and then a you know, 747. But, but trying to build the 747 right off the bat would be a tall order. So. Yeah, I agree, but you agree that it's something that we need to start talking about. Uh, yeah, I think it's definitely worth talking about. I mean, I think the, the technical solution, like I said, is, is, is um, I think, optimally uh, antimatter. Uh, I see, yeah. yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay, thank you for coming uh, to the IAC 2016, by the right. way. <laughs> right. Thanks, thanks for having me. <laughs> I was curious to know if you ever considered the idea of using a cycler and a semi-cycler to go to Mars on a routine basis, and if yes, why didn't you eventually go for it? Yeah, I think the I, I know when we do the um, try, try to figure out the best cost per unit mass to the surface of Mars. Um, the I mean, you could do a cycler, but I would. Our calculations at least show that it's just better to go directly there um, and, um, and, and not have a cycler. Uh, the transit time actually matters quite a lot for reuse, for reuse of the, space, the spaceship. So if you can, if you can reuse that spaceship uh, very frequently, um, then um, your cost per ton to Mars drops, drops a lot. So. Um, now, we could be wrong about that, and it could turn out in the future that having a cycler is, is a good way to go. But I would consider that to be in the realm of uh, potential future optimization, along with having a prop propellant depot on the moon. Um, that, that might make sense, but I would say put that in the, uh, the category of future optimization. <laughs>